Okay, so uh, how was your exam? Hmm? It doesn't have to be difficult. We will see in two weeks, probably. Well, we will see what will be the distribution. Um, if everybody gets 100, then you, you are right. If not, we know the distribution. Anyway, so uh, today we will be starting a new topic. Well, essentially, we will, at the end of this chapter at least, you should be able, to, you should understand how this thing works. You see, this is a, uh, essentially, there's a coil over here. It's, it's nothing but a solenoid that we had already studied. That if you pass a current through it, in that case, uh, it creates a magnetic field. Uh, let's see, here you have a lamp, and here you have another solenoid. This one is short, but it, ha it, it also has many turns. Let's put it over here. And if you create, the, if you start the magnetic field, well, nothing happens. Let me also put this iron rod. Now you get current. So you see, there's no battery over here. No on-off switch, no battery, no power source. But there is a solenoid over here. And if you pass an alternating current through the solenoid, and you, you also need to put this iron, you create a current. Well, for a current, you need an EMF. So essentially, this solenoid over here somehow creates an EMF. Now, some other things that, we will, that can be done is, let's say, this is just a, probably a copper ring. Nothing fancy, no wires, nothing at all. You put it in, you initiate the magnetic field, and it just jumps. Well, it, makes, it, it becomes better if you put this one in, the iron, it jumps further. Well, this is an aluminum one. It's lighter than the other one. So it jumps higher. And even without this, it jumps. And there is another aluminum. It didn't jump. It doesn't jump. So these are some of the observations we have. Why doesn't this jump? Well, the difference between these two rings is this ring is cut. There is here, there is a, uh, there is a cut. It's not closed. This one is closed. So anybody who wants to play? No? Sure, come. Which one would you like to try? Yeah, no, this, this one. It needs practice. <laughs> Do I have to catch it? Yeah, you lose points if you don't. <laughs> <laughs> Try whichever one you like. Mm. Nothing okay, happens so to it. This iron. Okay, so the questions we have, what does this iron do? You see, if you tried it without the iron, it didn't jump much. With the iron, it jumps much more. It's more dramatic with this one. With, with the iron, you see the light. Without the iron, you don't see it. Other questions? What does the iron do? Besides that one, which one? The iron. Well, okay. We will discuss what iron does. Is it like the Tesla coil? This is not the Tesla coil. No. 
Well, somewhat. Both are based on induction, let's say. And this is also based on induction. So let's, do, let's look at a simple example first to understand what's going on. So let's just take a, a region of space where there is a magnetic field. Again, for simplicity, let's just assume it's uniform. And inside it, let's put a rod. This is our rod. It is on conducting uh, rails. So it essentially closes the circuit. But let's assume here that you have a resistor, which can, which can be a light bulb, for example. <coughs> but there is no power source. And let's imagine somehow you, um, you hold that wire and push it so that it is moving with a speed V. You see, we had already discussed a similar problem to this one. In that case, what we had assumed was we, were, uh, we had a current running through this circuit, and there was a force acting on the rod. Now let's do it uh, the other way around. Let's just assume the rod is moving. Now, inside the rod, there are charges positive charges and negative charges, and they are also moving with the rod. Now, the positive charges, they cannot do anything else but move with the rod, but the negative charges, they are free to move around as long as they are inside the rod. So let's just pick one electron. It is p being pushed downward. So what is the force acting on it? This is the electron. Hmm? Well, let's see. V cross B is towards the right. But the electron is negatively charged, so the electron feels a force towards the left. Wait. Well, the force acting on a charge was Q V cross B. First, we have to calculate V cross B. V is, the first vector is pointing down, so four fingers down, the palm in the direction of the second vector, which is the magnetic field. So V cross B is in this direction, towards the right. But Q for the electron is negative, so it will be pointing towards the left. So this will feel the force <coughs> towards the left. And the magnitude of that force will be the charge of the electron, the speed of the rod, times the external magnetic field. And let's say the rod, ha this, this segment has a length L. How much work is done on this electron as it moves from this point to that point? The work done is well, I didn't say the work done by the magnetic field. It's the work done by the electron will be F times <coughs> L or E times V, B times L. The work per unit charge, which is V, B times L, but you see, this is nothing but the EM, EMF. We had defined the EMF as the work done on a unit charge by something before it was only the battery that was doing the work as the charge moves through your element. So in this case, as an electron goes from here to there, there is a work done on that electron. And the work done per unit charge is just VBL, which this, this is the EMF. This is sometimes called the motional EMF.
So the electrons will be, as long as the rod is moving, the electrons will be pushed around the circuit. So you get a current running through your circuit, and the direction of the current is clockwise or counterclockwise. It will be clockwise. The electrons will be running counterclockwise, but the current is in the opposite direction, so there will be a current running through the system. Well, this current will also create, create a magnetic field, by the way, in which direction this magnetic, this force, this newly created magnetic field will be. the magnetic field created by this current loop. It will be into the screen. You see, just wrap your fingers around the loop. So the magnetic field, you see, there is already an external magnetic field. Then there is this, due to this motion, there is a current created, and this current creates an additional magnetic field. And that newly created magnetic field, so-called the induced magnetic field, is pointing into the screen. Now, what about if the rod were moving upwards? What would be the direction of the induced magnetic field? Okay, if the rod were moving upward, let's do step by step. Let's say the rod was not moving downward, but it was moving upward. What will be the direction of the force acting on the electrons? Towards the right. So there will be an induced current. It will it be a clockwise or counterclockwise? It will be counterclockwise. What will be the direction of the magnetic field created by this new current inside the loop? It will be outward. Okay, these are some let's say basic observations for the time being. Now let's we had already seen that epsilon is V B times L. Now let's try to do it a bit more formally. Let's say that this distance, let's call that distance x. So v will be just dx by dt, minus dx by dt. Now v is in fact dx by dt. the velocity of the rod is just how fast its position is changing as a function of time. Now the EMF <coughs> will be dx by dt multiplied by b and l. <coughs> well, b is constant, l is constant, so I can just put everything in, in that derivative, b times x times l. <coughs> Sound equation. So what is x times L? It's the area. You see here there is the region where there is the magnetic field. x times L is nothing but the region in which there is a magnetic field. It's the total area. So the EMF is d by dt, b times the magnetic field times the area. Well, we had already seen something similar to this one in, when we were studying the electric field. We had defined the electric field times the area to be the electric flux. This time, this is the B times the area is what we call the magnetic flux. This is called the magnetic flux. And if B is constant and perpendicular to the surface, then phi B is just B times A. And in general, If B is not perpendicular, then 
then phi b is this vectorial scalar product. Do you remember how we had defined before the area vector? You take an area, the area vector is perpendicular to that, and the direction is kind of arbitrary. You can choose one direction or the other direction. So the flux, just like in the case of the electric flux, the magnetic flux can be both positive or negative. If B is pointing in the direction of your area vector, it is positive. If B is pointing in the opposite direction, then it is negative. <coughs> and B also need not be uniform, you see. This is valid if B is constant or uniform. And in general, the magnetic flux passing through any surface is written as an integral. So what you do is, if you have an arbitrary, let's say you have a region of space where the magnetic field lines are, have arbitrary shape, furthermore, your area can also have all kinds of bends. What you can do is divide this area into very small parts Within that very small part, B will be almost constant. So for that very small part, you can write the, you can use this expert, this definition of the flux, and then just add the fluxes passing through all the, these very small areas. This is the magnetic flux. So what we had achieved at this in this very simple example is that epsilon. In this problem, the EMF created by the motion of this rod is given by d phi b by dt. I will also insert a minus sign. We will discuss that minus sign in a moment. Why do I insert a minus sign? Up to here, because all my discussions assumed everything was positive. So I ignored the signs. What do you mean by x? It was x times l. OK. So you see, what we had done, seen was first, this is what we had derived. Then we converted v into the derivative of x, because the motion basically changes the x value. And so the EMF became the derivative of x multiplied by the magnetic field multiplied by the length of the rod. And at this, in this simple problem, B and L were constant, so I put them inside this derivative. But now, this expression over here, this is x, this expression over here just turned out to be the flux passing through my circuit. <coughs> now, when you look at the flux, you see, we said that flux is equal to B times the area. Flux can change basically because of two reasons. The area might be changing. Now, that was the case in our example. Or B might be changing. You see, you can increase B, you can decrease B. You, you can move B around rather than moving the road around. So that would cause your B to change. So now the question is, although we drive this result for a very simple example, is it valid in general? And the answer is yes. In fact, whatever your system is, this result turns out to be always correct. It doesn't have to be such a rectangular loop. It can have an arbitrary shape. And in this case, it's just this rod moving, but you can imagine a ring, you can twist it, and while you are twisting it, still there will be some current induced, and this will still be valid in every case. The EMF is always equal to this. 
whatever the reason of change of phi. Now, let's see. Let's go back to that example. You see, what happened over here? The road was moving down, so the flux was decreasing. Right? There was a decrease in flux, which created, then there was this induced current on the circuit, and this induced current increased B inside my loop. But if you increase B, you are increasing the flux. So the, the reason why we had this current over here was basically due to the motion of the rod, the flux passing through the circuit decreased. Now what the circuit did was it tried to increase B so as to eliminate this reduction in the flux. This is, this is a simple statement of simple demonstration of what is called the Lenz rule, which states that the induced current is always in the direction such that, uh, such that it tries to reduce the effect creating it. So this is an easy way to determine what will be the direction of the current in an arbitrary uh, case. Now let's go back over here. Okay, one possible, one interpretation of this Lenz rule in this case was, okay, if, as the rod is lowered, the flux is decreasing, which is inducing this current. So this, the current will be such that it will try to increase the flux inside. How can it do it if it can create an additional magnetic field into the screen? And such an additional magnetic field will be created into the screen if the current is running clockwise. Now, another way of looking at exactly the same problem, let's see, there is a current running through the system now. What will be the direction of the magnetic field, magnetic force? The magnetic force acting on the rod. You see, the magnetic force is I dl cross B. The current is running clockwise. So dl is pointing in that direction, four fingers in the direction of dl, b is into the screen, your palm in, into the screen, so dl cross b, the force is upwards. So the, what is creating this current is the downward motion of this rod. So the current is in such a direction that the force acting on the rod is pointing upwards, trying to stop this speed. Not necessarily, it depends. Can we increase the flux than its original value? Well, it depends. You can keep the current constant, but that would require wires without any resistance. You see, this resistance, you see, the velocity already fixes what is the EMF you have. So it's determined by the velocity. The current is de determined by the EMF and the resistance or the other elements in your circuit. So with the same EMF, you can get different currents if you have different resistors. So it will not always, it will not be able to cancel the effect, but it will try to reduce it. So let's do some other applications. Let's assume you have a ring over here, and now you take a magnet, 
with the north pole there, south pole over here. And the magnet is moving towards the ring. What do you think will happen? What will be the direction of the induced current? Well, the magnet creates magnetic field lines that look like this. Why? Hmm? Well, let's see. As it's approaching, if you define the direction of the area vector to be upward, the flux is positive, and the, as the magnet is approaching, the magnitude of the magnetic field is increasing because they are denser over here. So the flux is increasing as the magnet is approaching. So the, cur the induced current should try to reduce the flux. So it should create a magnetic field in the opposite direction, downward direction. Well, to create a magnetic field in the downward direction, the current should be like this. So it is into the screen over here, out of the screen over here, so this is how it will move, the, cur the induced current. Well, let's take exactly the same system. But let's switch the polarity of the magnet. So this is the south pole, and this is the north pole. Now what will be the direction? Well, again, let's take the area of this loop to be upward, so the flux is negative in this case. As the magnet is approaching, the magnetic field in this area is increasing in magnitude because the magnetic field lines are becoming denser. So the magnetic flux is decreasing. Increasing in magnitude, but it's in the negative. So it's decreasing. So it will try to increase the magnetic flux. To increase the magnetic flux, it should create a magnetic field pointing upward. To create a magnetic field pointing upward, the current should go like this. So on the left, it will be pointing towards you. On the right, it will be pointing away from you. Well, how did we define the north pole of the magnet? Hmm? Well, the north pole is the pole where the magnetic field lines are emerging, and the south pole is where the magnetic field lines are entering the magnet. Now, let's look at this one. This, there is a current running in this sense. So the magnetic field lines are going down and then up back in. So below is the north pole of this loop, above is, is the south pole of this loop. So you have two magnets whose north poles are close to each other, so they will repel each other. Well, you can also say that they should repel each other using the lens rule. You see, the reason why there is an induced current is that this separation is being decreased due to the motion of the magnet. Lenz rule says that the induced current will be such that it will, it will try to reduce that effect. So it should, the induced current should be such that the force acting on this loop should be away from the magnet. So it should, 
there is a force pushing it up. Any questions on lens rule? Well, you see, which one? Which part? On the string. Yeah. Why the, uh, the induced current is in this direction, is that clear? Yeah. Okay, why the force is pushing it away? Well, there are two different ways of looking at it. One is just treating this as a magnet. Once there is an induced current, the bottom part will be the north pole, the upper part will be the south pole. So two north poles close to each other, they will push each other apart. Then there is the lens rule interpretation. The reason why we have this induced current is that this separation is becoming smaller. So if there are any forces in the system created by this induced current, it should be such that it will try to increase that distance, and that is only possible if this force points up. It pushes the ring away from this magnet. Now at least we have an explanation of this part. You see, we have the solenoid. Why does it push it out? And why doesn't it push this one where there is this cut? Here there won't be any current. You see, by pushing this button, I'm sending a current through my solenoid. But that creates a magnetic field. So now there is no magnetic field. When I push that button, there is a magnetic field created. So there is a change in the magnetic field. Well, the areas are constant. Flux is magnetic field times the area. If magnetic field is changing, so is the flux is changing. So you get a current induced on these rings but not on this one, because the current induced on this one cannot just go around, it's cut. And that induced current will create a f exert a force. Well, you have a magnetic field and the current, magnetic field will exert a force on the current. And the force will be such that it will reduce the induced uh, current, it will reduce the change in the flux. So the force will just push the ring away from the flux. Any questions? Now let's look at that minus sign once more. You see we said epsilon is equal to minus d phi b by dt. Now what is epsilon? the EMF, which we defined as the work done per unit charge. So what does the work? It's some kind of an electric field that does the work. And the EMF would be essentially the integral of E dot DL. Let's say that here we have a closed loop, an electron well, it, uh, there is a work done on the electron along this path, but we can also ask, calculate the electric, the work done by the electric on the electron as it completes one full circle. Well, there won't be any work done over here in this example. The work done will be only along this road, but the total work done will be just the work done over here. So not, we are not really changing anything. Well, in that case, that tells me that I can calculate the EMF as, I can define that EMF as such a loop integral. I integrate the electric field around the closed loop. So the law, the Faraday's law just becomes the integral of the electric field around the closed loop is equal to minus 
the change in the magnetic flux. Or let us write it in this form, minus d by dt b dot dA. Now, what are these integrals? Here, there is this closed loop. In our example, it was the wire. And we, if we in integrate the electric field around that loop, what we get is how much the flux changes. That is, the in how much the integral of the ma magnetic field over the area changes. Now, this is kind of clear if you are going in one direction, that is the direction of dl. We said that the area vector was arbitrary when you were defining the flux, but when you are writing this equation, you have to be consistent. Meaning that, okay, on one hand, you have this loop which encloses the area. You give a direction to that loop. On the other hand, you give a direction to the area. These two definitions should be consistent. They are arbitrary as long as they are consistent with each other. Consistent meaning that they should be related by the right-hand rule. So, for example, in this problem, if you calculate the EMF along this line, then the L is pointing counterclockwise at every point, no, clockwise at every point, so the area vector has to be point, use your right-hand rule, into the screen. You can just as well calculate that integral of e the electric field around such a loop. And if you take the, the integral of the electric field around such a loop, then you have to define the area vector to be pointing towards you. Those two things has to be consistent with each other. That is the crucial thing. And if they are consistent with each other, this basically is the lens rule, this minus sign. It opposes this change, in a sense. So let's sum up what we had done. Okay, we started from a very simple looking problem where we had this rod moving in a magnetic field. And now we said that if we have such a circuit, then we, there's an EMF induced in this circuit due to this motion. And we calculate, we, knew, we know the force acting on a charge Using that force, we calculated the work done per unit charge, which was the EMF. Then we said, okay, but we can write the same expression as, we can just write the EMF as the rate of change of the magnetic flux. Now, why is the flux changing in our problem? Well, basically this, this area inside this circuit, this circular circuit, is becoming smaller and smaller. That's why the flux was changing in that problem. So this is what we had obtained. But then the question is, how general is that? Although we drive this only for this simple case, it turns out that experiments show us that this is true whatever the circumstances are. You see, the flux is magnetic field times the area. The flux can change if B is changing. This law is valid. The flux can change if A is changing. That law is still valid. And in fact, that is why we get this light. Now, we will come to this magnet later on. But let me stick it for the time being. You see, here we have the solenoid. 
when I turn on the current, there is a magnetic field created inside the solenoid. So the magnetic field is changing. So there is a changing magnetic field passing through this hole. So there is a flux passing through this hole, and that flux is changing. You see, the first time Faraday did his experiments, he used a direct current, and he didn't get any electric field, any EMF. Except then when he closed the switch and when he opened the switch, because only at those times the current, the magnetic field was changing. But here I'm using an alternating current. There's an AC coming from the uh, electricity over here. Well, we had already discussed AC. In AC, the potential enhanced current is constantly changing directions. We will study it in more detail these weeks. So here, as long as there is AC running through my solenoid, I get light because the electric field is constantly changing. I'm sorry, the magnetic field is constantly changing, and hence it is inducing an EMF which can be calculated through this law if we know the magnetic field passing through that loop, if we know how many turns are over here, we can calculate the total flux and see its time dependence and calculate the EMF. So we can even calculate the current if we know the resistance over here in this lamp. Now, any questions up to here? Well, you see, here, let's go up. In this example, I didn't really care about the signs. I just were, were I was looking at only the magnitudes. Now, when we are talking about the EMF as the work done as a charge is moving from one point to the other point, well, in this case, we will be talking about the work done on the charge as it completes one circle, one loop. Which direction should we take the loop? Let's, say, let's take this direction. So if we take this direction, the EMF, at least the force on the electron is pointing in that direction, so the current will be running in this direction. That basically it tells us that if the, there is a positive work done by this EMF as we are going around this loop. Okay? But if we are going in that direction, let's say, so the flux is the flux positive or negative? <coughs> so if we are going in the clockwise sense, the area should be, your right hand, the area should be into the screen, or the flux will be positive if the magnetic field is into the screen. So the flux is positive. Okay, so if in this problem at least the EMF is positive, the flux is positive but decreasing because the area is becoming smaller. So the rate of change of flux is negative. So EMF cannot be equal to the rate of change of the flux, but it can only be equal to minus the rate of change of the flux. That's why we insert the minus sign. And this is a problem. This, these signs arise because we want to pay attention to uh, the directions of the loop that we are using to calculate the EMF and the, air, the direction of the area. So here, in fact, if we do take into account whether the EMF is positive, negative, or the flux is positive or negative, when we make this derivation in this equation, we would automatically get a minus sign. In fact, in this derivation, in this particular example, the minus sign is over here.
you see these directions are correct if the road is moving downward and v is the speed of the road but dx by dt is negative because x is getting smaller and smaller so i have to put a minus sign over there and it just passes along Other questions? Now, I will add one more comment before you go. You see, up to here, we, we were always talking about the wires, the currents, etc. But even if there is no wires, everything we said is, will still be valid. So it's, this tells us that if there is a changing magnetic field, it will tell us that there will be an electric field created at that point. Well, if you put a wire, then the charges in the wire will start moving and hence that electric field will also create a current. But the electric field will be there independent of whether you have a, the wire or not. Okay, any last questions? Okay, so see you on Thursday.